organized here. All right, thank you guys for being here. I know this is a stressful time of year. A lot of things going on, a lot of, a lot of changes, a lot of school ending, a lot of all sorts of things happening, so I appreciate you making the time to be here this morning. So as you're probably aware, for over a year, our country, our culture, and our world has been fighting an invisible enemy. In a turn of events, unlike anything most of us have experienced in our lifetimes, we have found ourselves doing battle with an adversary that cannot be seen. And while it has often been described as novel, the truth is that it is not very new. To be clear, the enemy that I'm talking about this morning is not COVID. It is fear. Now, this is not to say that COVID isn't real or that it's not a legitimate threat. It very clearly is real, and it has been devastating in so many ways. We mourn the loss of life and the suffering that has come about as a result of this very real and very serious virus. I'm certainly not a COVID denier, and I'm not going to use my platform this morning to rant about masks or lockdowns or anything like that. However, <clears throat> I think that we can all agree that the pandemic has amplified and exacerbated our fears in so many ways. Now, certainly the virus has done real serious and even devastating damage, but so has our fear. We have all seen various examples of things very quickly accelerating from reasonable precautions to bizarre overreactions in many cases, like you'll see on the screen. These are just a few of the many little tidbits on the internet of people completely overreacting in bizarre ways. I also saw a video a couple of weeks ago of a mom spraying her kids in the face with Lysol in the grocery store as if that's somehow healthier than, <laughs> than breathing. That's crazy, right? Our fears have gotten out of control. And I only bring all of this up because I believe that the pandemic has revealed something very important about how we view our world, something that needs to be addressed biblically. Now, wherever we stand in terms of COVID precautions, I believe that we would be wise to admit this difficult truth. And hear me on this. Our fear has been misplaced. From a biblical perspective, and particularly from the perspective of the wisdom of the book of Proverbs, which we've been studying over the last six weeks in our basic instruction series, we have been um, <clears throat> seeing that there's a very different picture of fear. In contrast to the manic, hysterical, reactionary fear that has gripped our world for over a year, Proverbs shows us a different perspective on fear. The word fear appears 21 times in the book of Proverbs, and in all but one of those instances, it is fear of the Lord. That is the context for fear as far as the biblical wisdom of Proverbs is concerned. And if you were here way back in the first week when um, Pastor Cody McNutt opened this series for us, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, he read this. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So throughout the book of Proverbs, we see fear of the Lord not only as the foundation upon which we build our knowledge, but the driving force for how we live and behave. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We, as people of God, are to operate out of a healthy, informed, and robust fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is meant to be our motivation for all of life, not the fear of other things. God is to be feared. You'll hear that sometimes in church circles, but if you're new to the Bible or if you're, if you're not relatively familiar with what church is like, that can sound really strange, right? Right? Who are these weirdo Christians that are living in fear of God? I understand that it can sound like a confusing perspective. But it is a biblical concept that we can't avoid. We do believe in an all-powerful creator God who is good. And the, the key word here is holy. That this God is different. That he's separate. Outside of all of our experiences, outside of our physical world, we talked about this last week, that there is a spiritual reality of a good God. And like I said, that God is holy, which means he is set apart and different. And mostly that means that he is without sin. While his creation may be infected with sin and our lives are infected with sin, sin goes against God's very character. It's not that God made an unreasonable set of rules that people just can't follow. No, holy is who he is. And sinful is what we are. And for that reason, God is opposed to sin. 
God hates sin and God judges sin. He is right to judge it and punish it. So in that way, God is to be feared. Now, this doesn't mean that we live in constant fear that God will smite us at any moment, but rather that we operate from the perspective that we understand that he would be justified in doing so. Puritan theologian John Flavel puts it like this. You'll see the quote on the screen. He said, Godly fear does not arise from a perception of God as hazardous, but glorious. And that is exactly right. Fear of the Lord is awe at his holiness and glory. It's the acknowledgement that he is right and that we are often wrong. Fear of the Lord is the abandonment of pride and the taking up of humility. In the light of the spiritual reality of God, we see our own sinfulness, our own failures, our own flaws. And this should lead us to healthy fear. Fear that is the beginning of knowledge, as it says. Fear that leads us to choose what God says is best over our own sinful preferences. To fear him means that we submit to his authority, trusting that his ways are good. We do not fear God because he is a brutal dictator, but instead we fearfully submit to his rule because he is a benevolent designer. Fear of the Lord is the trust and belief that his commands and his designs are good. Consider Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23. It says this, The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. Or look at another proverb, Proverbs chapter 14, verses 26 to 27. It says, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. See, as much as we may tend to think of something like the fear of the Lord as something that's negative, that's not how it's presented here, is it? It's not that he's some angry deity waiting to exact punishment in us. That simply isn't the picture that we see in Proverbs. Instead, we see that fearing God means joyful and willful submission to his divine authority and commands. And as those passages show us very clearly, we can do so confidently, knowing that his ways, as it says, lead us to life. By fearfully submitting to God and his ways, we can rest satisfied in the knowledge of fear of him. We have confidence and trust. So as we begin to approach this topic today, the first blank on your sheet is this. This is the basic truth. We should fear the Lord and trust his ways. We should fear the Lord and trust his ways. For us, this is a fountain of life. It isn't cowering and hiding from God. It is confidently living as he commands for our own good and for his own glory. But what does it mean for us to fear God and trust his ways? What does that look like in living right now for us? Well, let's look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 8, a pretty common proverb. You've probably heard it before. We're going to use this as a framework for our understanding this morning. It says this. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Now, like, you, like I said, you've probably heard this before, but let's really consider all that it's teaching here. This verse presents for us a healthy fear of the Lord and the reasoning for trusting his ways. It's a simple and beautiful acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and goodness. And just on a side note, this would be a really good passage, just a few verses for you to memorize with your kids. Put it on the dry erase board in your house, put it on your fridge, put it wherever they see it. Memorize this passage. It's super important for how we think about God. Now, for the vast majority of difficult circumstances in life, Proverbs 3, 5 stands as the baseline answer. When we ask ourselves, what should I do? Proverbs 3, 5 should echo in our minds. What do we do when we find ourselves feeling fearful about wor world events? Trust in the Lord. What do we do when we find ourselves feeling like we're suffering, like we're dealing with tremendous loss? What are we to do? 
trust in the Lord? What do we do when parenting feels absolutely overwhelming? Trust in the Lord. What do we do when we're faced with a difficult moral decision? Trust in the Lord. Now, sure, that doesn't solve every situation immediately, but what it does is reorient our hearts. Now, echoing this in our minds over and over again, that doesn't give us an immediate answer. It doesn't give us an immediate what to do, but it does point us to where the solution should come from, right? It's pointing us to the giver of the wisdom that should guide us in taking those steps. If we can begin from a place of trusting in and fearing the Lord, that means that we're laying aside our pride in order to find a solution from outside of ourselves. And this verse seems to make it quite clear that fearing and trusting in the Lord requires an exchange. In order for us to fear God and trust him, that means that we have to give up trust in ourselves. Fearing God and trusting in him is an absolute act of humility, which is why the passage said very clearly, trust in the Lord with all your heart, meaning that there is no part left of you that's depending on you or anything else. It's no longer clinging to self that you are instead fully depending on the goodness and the guidance of God. And then the verse says, and do not lean on your own understanding. This is a, a pretty tough point that I feel like we need to dwell on for just a moment here. The next blank on your sheet is this. Fearing and trusting God means that we do not rely on our own understanding. Let that sink in for just a moment. Now hear me on this. The human mind is a wonderful and powerful thing. The achievements of mankind throughout history are unparalleled among God's creatures. Together, we have made advancements in language, architecture, society, agriculture, art, math, science, medicine, music, technology, and so many other things. What humans have accomplished is absolutely amazing. Our collective intellect is astonishing. But if you were to combine all the knowledge of all the people in all of history, it still doesn't hold a candle to the idea of the knowledge of an omnipotent, omniscient God, does it? All that we have gathered and known together is nothing compared to the knowledge of God. Which brings me to this passage from the New Testament. We opened our service with it a couple weeks ago, if you remember. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 34. Paul says this, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Now, contrary to popular belief, I don't believe that as a society that we are the smartest people that have ever lived. And even more than that, I think if we were individually honest, we would admit that we're probably not the smartest person living right now, right? <laughs> so who then are we to trust in our own understanding? We have a God who created the world and who is sovereign over every inch of it. That God is active in his world and he is attentive to those who seek his wisdom. So the call for us then is, no matter how smart or well-equipped we may think that we are, we are not to lean on our own understanding, but instead to fear God and to trust his understanding. Think of it like this for just a moment. Raise your hand if you can think of a specific time when you were a kid where you made a really poor decision. Okay, we're in agreement then, right? We've all made poor decisions in the past. It's not to say that you were a dumb kid. It's just that you had the understanding of a kid, right? Your understanding was what? Not what it could eventually be. You needed the guidance of someone that is wiser than you to help you, to prevent you from making that kind of decision, right? That's the whole point of parents. You are to offer the understanding that you have gleaned over your years to your kids in order to guide them and help them make right choices. Now, let's get this a little more difficult. Raise your hand if you can think of a recent poor decision that you have made as an adult. Like this, this continues, right? 
Yes, you are smarter and wiser than you were when you were a child. You are not making those same kinds of bad decisions. You're not living in that lack of wisdom anymore. And yet, there is still a lack of wisdom. We are all prone to stumble, fall, and fail in various ways. In fact, if you're willing to sit down and give it some thought, I'm sure that you could come up with a pretty good list of reasons why you should not lean on your own understanding. Yes, our understanding has grown and developed since we were kids. Heck, I would hope that your intellectual understanding continues to grow with each passing day. But that doesn't mean that it has or ever will grow to the point that it is infallible and totally reliable. Instead, we should have hearts that say, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. We fear and trust in a God whose understanding is so completely beyond us. He's our eternal creator with a plan that long precedes us and that will go on much after us. Fearing God and trusting in him often means admitting that our own understanding maybe just isn't that good. As it said in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7, we read it a minute ago, Be not wise in your own eyes. In other words, if you think you've got it all figured out, you are wrong. Or consider the somewhat harsh words of Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26. It says this, Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Ouch. Now, while it may be hard to hear, fearing and trusting in God means that we do not rely on our limited understanding. So as we reflect on the concept of fearing and trusting God this morning, take a moment of kind of self-evaluation and introspection and ask yourself, how much do I tend to to make all my life decisions based on my limited perspective? How much am I leaning on my own understanding? And, and honestly, if it's a lot, how much is that connected to pride, thinking that my understanding is best? But there's more that we can learn about fearing and trusting God from Proverbs chapter three. Look at verse six. It says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. What does it mean for us to acknowledge God in all our ways? Well, I don't think we should think of it in sort of a passive shout out to God every now and then. It's not the same as like when you acknowledge someone, when you hold the door open for them and they go through the door and you kind of nod at them. That's an acknowledgement, right? That's not the kind of acknowledgement that it's talking about here. The acknowledgement that we're talking about here, to acknowledge God in all our ways, means much more. It means to treat him as the most trusted counselor, to show him the, most, the utmost respect to give him the highest honor and to, admit and to submit to his sovereign control and rule in all of your ways, in all of your behaviors, in all the things that you do. So the next blank on your sheet is this. If we're gonna understand what it means to fear and trust in the Lord, we need to understand that fear and fearing and trusting God means that we do not insist on our own control. We are people who love to feel in control. Control feels like power, and we like to feel powerful over our lives. We tend to use words to describe ourselves like independent or self-sufficient, but really what those words are covering up for us is rebellious against God. Now, you are smart and capable people. I hope that you typically walk away feeling encouraged by what you hear, but to truly live in God's wisdom means not always relying on your own intellect or your own capability. As good as you may be at controlling your own life, I can promise you this, God is better. As we consider what it means for us to fear and trust God, we must understand that it's not only what we do not, that we do not lean on our own understanding, but that we instead look to God to order our steps and straighten our paths. Acknowledging God in all our ways means giving up our own desire in many ways and even our own control and instead submitting to his ways. Consider Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. It says this, The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Think on that for just a moment. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. 
as Proverbs seems to kind of communicate a little bit of a balance here. If we're to ask ourselves, if I'm supposed to give control to God, does that mean that I just don't do anything? Do I just float through life and not make any decisions? No, that's not what this proverb presents. No, plan your way, but acknowledge God in all your ways. In other words, let, let it be known that he establishes your steps. This is the balance. It is good and right for us to plan and work and be responsible. God wants us to put in effort, but he also wants us to have hearts that acknowledge him in all our ways, hearts that say, God, here is my very best. This is what I think you want me to do, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. But God, it's you that orders my steps. Be present in everything that I do. Correct me when I need correction. Guide me when I need guidance. Encourage me when I'm on the right track. But in every single step, by my best efforts, God, it is you who is in control. And believe me when I say I understand that this one is hard. It's hard to loosen my grip on the control of my own life. But I think one of the positive things of coming through a global pandemic is this. We were all reminded over the last year, whether we like it or not, that whatever control we thought we had over our own lives was kind of an illusion in the first place, right? You have been in less control over your life over the last year than probably ever before. Embrace that. Give over control to the one who is deserving of it. So in a moment once more of introspection this morning, ask yourself, how much do I find myself insisting on my own control over every aspect of my life? What can I do to loosen my grip on control and instead trust in the Lord? Our reliance on our own understanding and our insistence on being in control are rooted not only in pride, but like I said at the beginning, they're rooted in fear. We see ourselves often as wholly capable and wholly responsible, but that makes us also wholly fearful. We fear what others may think of us. We fear that we'll be left alone. We fear failure. We fear the consequences of our decisions. We fear death. But the idea here is that we are trading one fear for another. We're trading earthly fear for a greater fear the fear of the Lord. Look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. It says this. <clears throat> the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. There are real and legitimate things to fear in this world. There are real dangers, but allowing those fears to be our guiding principle, to be the thing that directs our lives, is a snare, as it says. It is a trap. It prevents us from being who we are meant to be. The last blank on your sheet is this this morning. Fearing and trusting God means that we do not succumb to our earthly fears. We are not ruled even by real things that we fear on this earth. Not only do we have a God with eternal understanding that far exceeds our own, not only do we have a God who is far more qualified to exert control over our lives, but we also have a God who has an eternal plan that goes beyond all the things that we may fear in this world. And for that reason, we can't allow ourselves to fall into the trap and the snare of the fear of men, as the verse said, or really the fear of anything else on this earth. You see, as Christians on this side of the cross, we see God's plan in its fullness revealed in Jesus Christ. As we covered fully in our last series called Overcome, Jesus has overcome the world. By his sinless life, his sacrificial death, and his triumphant resurrection, he has given us eternal life by his grace. And that means no matter how terribly things may go for us here on this earth, we have a different ending a beautiful and secure destiny in him. We will live eternally with Jesus Christ in glory. And that knowledge gives us a confidence and a security that should far outweigh any of the fears of this world, no matter how legitimate those fears are. Consider with me this passage from the New Testament. In the book of Luke, Jesus teaches his disciples something that's really hard, something hard for us to hear even today. This is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 to 5. <clears throat> he says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. 
but I will warn you who to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Once again, we see this, this pairing of the fear of the Lord that overshadows the fears of this world. The disciples had already experienced many reasons to be afraid. They had taken on real significant risk in uprooting their lives to follow this crazy person, Jesus. Now, even more than that, as they followed Jesus, they had legitimately been chased out of towns and threatened with violence on multiple occasions. What we know, as the story continued to unfold, is that even after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, those disciples continued to face greater and greater threats. Almost all of them were killed or martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. And we have to think to ourselves, this idea must have echoed in their minds. Jesus told them specifically, the worst thing that can happen to you on this earth is that someone could kill you. And most people read that and say, well, well, gosh, that sounds pretty bad. Like, I don't want to be killed. And of course you do. That's a real legitimate fear. But Jesus' message was this. That's not the worst thing that can happen to you. Do not fear men because all they can do is kill the body. But instead, fear the one who can, after you die, send you to hell. Fear the Lord above all things. The worst that can happen is that you die. But if you were in the hand of Jesus Christ, there is nothing that will take that away. <clears throat> There may be many reasons for us to be fearful on this earth, but we do not succumb to fear. We are not overwhelmed by it because our fear of the Lord shows us a deeper truth. When we live with our eyes set on the eternal, we don't have to fear the temporary. Every one of you will die one day. But if you are a person who has repented of your sins and trusted in Christ, that is not the end for you. For that reason, we do not fear the things of this earth because we fear our Lord. God is to be feared. His judgment is righteous and we are found to be guilty because of all our sin. God is also to be trusted because he has made a way for us to be saved. If we repent of our sins and put our faith in the finished work of his son, Jesus Christ, we have eternal life with him. The matter is settled. It is finished. Now, our sin-broken world will give us many reasons to fear, but our fear of the Lord and the trust that he deserves must overshadow all of our earthly fears. When we face circumstances that we absolutely can't understand, we do not lean on our own understanding, but on the understanding of a God who knows everything. When circumstances make us feel like we have completely lost the control that we held so tightly to, we trust in a God who is all-powerful and sovereign over all things. And when the world gives us ample reasons to fear, even enough to fear for our very lives, we do not succumb to that fear. Because Jesus suffered the death and the punishment that we deserve, we do not fear even death itself. By his grace, Jesus has purchased for us life everlasting. As Solomon's father, David, said in Psalm chapter 27, verse 1 that we read at the beginning of our service today, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? <clears throat> the message of Proverbs is clear. Fear and trust in the Lord. Maybe you need to take a moment to pray this morning as we close our service and repent of the idea that you have been leaning on your own understanding in all things. Give that up to God and say, God, I, I've been leaning too much in my understanding. I need your understanding. Or this morning, maybe as we continue and pray this morning, you should pray, God, forgive me for insisting on my own control over every aspect of my life. Help me to let go. Help me to loosen my grip and let go of that control. Or if you have found yourself, especially over the last year or so, living fearful of all the things that could happen. Give that fear over to God and fear him first, knowing that your eternity can be secure in Jesus Christ. Fear and trust in the Lord. Let's pray together. <clears throat> God, we are so thankful that you are a God who can be trusted, that though you are a God that is to be feared, that you have made a way for people to be saved. <clears throat> 
God, your wrath is real, and your hatred of sin is justified. But God, you poured out that hatred of sin, your own wrath, on your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be saved. Help us to live as people who understand the fullness of who you are and what you've done, that we live in you.